I would like to welcome the members of the Multimodality Special Interest Group, as well as the guests from different parts of the world uh, that have joined us this morning. Uh, just a quick introduction, the Multimodality Special Interest Group comprises of faculty members and PhD students from NIE, as well as other universities who are interested in exploring multimodality in education. Um, other members seek to learn from each other's work, as well as to explore collaborations on research projects and publications with like-minded people. Personally, I have found quite a number of critical friends in this group that have helped me sharpen my work. As a community of practice, we come together for a regular sharing session every month amongst ourselves. And we have also invited uh, international scholars. So this year, we have invited uh, Professor Maria Grazia Sindoni and Professor Len Unsworth. Uh, if you're interested to join the group, um, I encourage you to look out for the email post event um, and let us know. Now, as always, one of the affordances of the Zoom video conferences, apart from having guests from all over the world join us, is the fact that we can use the chat function to write our thoughts and ask questions, which we can then turn to during the discussion. So please feel free to use it during the session. So once again, welcome to today's uh, session on the topic of Towards Education Justice, a Pedagogy of Multiliteracies Revisited. Today, we are so privileged to have with us um, the leading lights of multiliteracies and the convenience of the new London group to spend time with us, Professor Mary Galantis and Professor Bill Cope. Some of you may notice that this year is the 25th anniversary since the new London group published its hugely influential manifesto and introduced the work, the concept of multiliteracies as a response to the literacy needs in a changing world. Now, if there's any doubts that academics can inspire educational reforms, I encourage you to look no further than the new London group and Professor Bill Cook and Mary Calentis. Since then, you will know that many education systems around the world have incorporated multiliteracies into its English language uh, curriculum, okay. including Singapore, where multiliteracies is one of the three pedagogical okay. emphasis in the EL 2020 syllabus. Mary and Bill are professors in the College of Education at the University of Illinois at Bernard Champaign in the United States, and we are very grateful that they have accommodated the Singapore timing, given that it's already late in the evening for them. And thank you also for coming early this morning um, for the session. Now, you will have all know that uh, Bill and Mary have published many books and papers. And most recently, they published a two volume grammar of multimodal meaning titled Making Sense and Adding Sense. And I highly recommend it for its contribution towards what they describe as a theory of meaning in everyday life. So colleagues and friends, we are very privileged to have Mary and Bill with us this morning. And I would like to encourage you to invite you to put your hands together to welcome Professor Mary Calentis and Professor Bill Cook. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Victor, for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. Uh, we are very pleased to be with you, and we thank the institutions who organize this uh, uh, discussion this evening. Um, uh, you, oh, this morning in Singapore. Oh, it's this morning there. Oh, it's this evening here. So we're living, we're living in yesterday. <laughs> well, as, as Victor said, um, if we could move along, Bill. Uh, uh, right. Uh, it was um, quite a long time ago now, 1994 actually, when that group there pictured on the right gathered in New London um, Courtney uh, lived near this particular place and it was ironically ironic for us that it was called New London and we gathered there for a week and what we did and this matters for the way we contextualize what we're going to say uh, we left our personal reputations at the door and went in to discuss the gaps that were stubborn and enduring in our education systems between those who were able to reach their potential and those who weren't. Really, that was the most important thing for us and all of us came together uh, in this site to kind of work out what the issues might be of the moment and of the future and to come up with a manifesto, a call for action and of course, when the Harvard Ed Review published it, we weren't quite sure uh, what impact it was going to have. And later, of course, your pedagogy's journal there in Singapore also published uh, a version of the work. Uh, it has uh, had enormous uh, take up around the world. And what we're going to do today is uh, just go 
take you on a journey uh, to the original ideas and then uh, to introduce to you the way in which Bill and I have taken up that call to action in a continuous way through our own work. So I want to, we want to start, oh Bill, you're going to do the, the next part. So I'm just going to mention a little bit of the, the history. I mean, um, we, we started doing work in Sydney and this is when we started first working with Gunter Kress and um, with um, other folks there in Sydney around this genre approach to literacy. And we published that book um, before the multiliteracies work. After a while, we became a little bit unhappy with it because it seemed to be dealing very much with text and the world um, was obviously becoming a much more complicated place than to just simply think about how conventional texts work. So this multiliteracies work here, um, Mary's just mentioned the two articles, um, the book was a slightly larger group where we got a couple of other people involved as well, um, particularly um, uh, Pippa Stein and Denise Newfield from the University of Wageningen in South Africa, um, and Joe Lobianco, who's a, a multilingual um, expert. So that was the you know the first statement with the journal articles. Then we put this book together, and then um, more recently, um, Mary and I have kind of restated this argument with the book called Literacy, which um, has gone through two editions now, 2012, 2016, and has been translated into these other languages, into Spanish and Portuguese and Greek. Um, but the most recent work, as, as Victor just mentioned, is we've been doing working on this transpositional grammar. And one thing I want to say is these are not books about education. Um, um, uh, and they're long. Um, I don't think they're we tried to make them not difficult to read, but really it's trying to think about, okay, how does one think about frameworks of meaning in the world which are broader than the framework of language? And they were published last year in 2020. Right. Now, um, one thing I, I want to say is that Bill and I have always worked in teams and in collaboration. Um, everything that we've done, we've done with others. And we just wanted to give you uh, just a small um, indication of the way in which uh, we work together and of course you all know Alan Luke and uh, he said of our getting together then that what we were on about was equity and social justice and uh, clearly uh, for us is uh, as educators it was how do you open up uh, educational opportunities for those who are denied it or for circumstances beyond their control can't access them so that's a uh, one of, one of the group of the New London group. Another member of the New London group, Courtney Kasdan, of course, uh, who first was very critical of us and the work we were doing in uh, genre theory, uh, eventually became a close friend and colleague. But she and Ellen came up with the idea of um, uh, pedagogies, uh, of weaving pedagogies, that there was no singular pedagogy that would work um, and it was important both to do immersion and explicit teaching. And this was important because then the wars were raging around different literacy approaches and of course uh, the, the polarities were never going to help the children or, or any adults or anybody in the, in the learning uh, context. And, and we were firmly of the view, and you'll hear us saying this again and again uh, this evening, that what professional educators need to have is repertoires uh, and to make uh, purposeful choices. And uh, Alan and, and Courtney uh, constructed that as, as pedagogical weaving. And of course, uh, Jim G, um, who was a, a key member of our group, he said to us, it's not going to go anywhere, he said, because high stakes testing, you know, will prevent any kind of reform. However, he was in, he and Gunther and others kept saying that meaning making was people getting together to create and recreate. Um, it was, meaning wasn't about, you know, drawing on the storehouse in your mind of rules that you've learned. And that was an important uh, basic uh, consideration as we were in New uh, discussing issues in New London. And Gunter Kress, uh, who wasn't an educator, he didn't come in as an educator, and the multiliteracies, even the term was a compromise. Uh, we had to kind of figure out a way of being able to talk about the multiplicities of, uh, around the issues, both social and around literacy. And, um, and he says, uh, he said then and, and later, 
um, that it, it changed all of us in some way. So, um, the two multis of multiliteracy. Um, always, and importantly for us, the life world, the situation, the context in which learners come to any environment is as critical as the means in which uh, the means they take on in order to make m meaning. Uh, like you, uh, then we used to we called it multimodality. Since then, we've shifted, and Bill will speak more about this soon. To talking about multi forms, um, the text or images and spaces, objects, body sounds in which people use to make meaning, but always in the context of their life world. So this life world concept is important to us. So what we have this in this yellow circle here is we have formal learning. This is our education system. And what's interesting is what's different about education from the world outside of education. It's about systematically thinking about knowledge. It's about deeper understandings, things that don't happen in casual experience, about crit critical um, reflection, and it's about um, broadening the horizons of, of, of learners and broadening the scope of their possibility. And the phrase we've often used um, to describe that is formal learning is distinctively learning by design. Now the contrast then is of course a lot of learning happens in the life world. So when our students come to school they come with languages and experiences and feelings and sentiments which they've learned primarily informally by immersion in that world. So the life world is the world of everyday experience things that are immediately surrounding learners and their subjectively felt identities. But it's incredibly important if formal learning is not engaged with that, um, uh, the, 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 it's, it's not gonna necessarily work. And what we've often done in learning is we've had a, an idea which is called the curriculum or it's called the syllabus or it's called the standards. And we've often forgotten about that life world. But one of the things about the life world which is really, really important is how deeply diverse it is. No two people's life experiences in that life world are the same, particularly in this era of globalization and cosmopolitan identities. So um, originally way back 25 years ago now, you know, we asked uh, three, we put three questions uh, to the group. Uh, and it was really about how we were to think about the reform of literacy. In the first why, what's happening around us uh, that requires us uh, to think about uh, the way in which meaning is made and the role that literacy plays? And of course today, particularly post-COVID, that question becomes even more important as people are, are struggling to know how to move forwards, move backwards, uh, what kind of uh, tools we're going to use and what kind of uh, literacy or literacies are going to be involved. But the why is only one part. The other question was, once you've asked the why, well, what sort of uh, literacy are you going to teach? What does it mean? What are the forms and functions of uh, any kind of uh, mode that you're using. And finally, or not finally, equally importantly, is pedagogy. Th this is one of the most difficult areas because um, I think as, as Bill kind of referred earlier, instructional um, sequences, you know, and tests at the end of them, keeping people busy is often what happens in classrooms. But pedagogy is about epistemic goals, right? and purposeful ones and every choice that you make in an instructional activity has some epistemic under, underlying condition and we think that educators who are professionals need to be aware of, of these uh, the potential and the choices and to make purposeful choices for the individual for the group for the glass for the subject area so these were the three questions then and we believe that today they remain equally and uh, important and equally and ambiguous in the way in which we respond to each one of those. And so what we're going to do in this talk is just ask those three questions again, the original questions we asked all those years ago um, and that we keep asking. So th this is the structure of the talk, the three parts of the talk that we're going to go through now. So um, let's go now on to the first of these questions, which is the why. So, um, Mary will start on this. Right, so uh, we'll keep coming back to this point, the, the point of the life world, 
you know, we prepare learners for work, we prepare them for ongoing learning in their lives, we prepare them to be citizens in a public life. And across all those domains, uh, their personal context makes a difference uh, in terms of uh, uh, the outcomes for their lives and the way that they can uh, uh, manage uh, uh, negotiating the challenges and the opportunities across those three realms. But the other thing that has become even more important, back then, 25 years ago, we were anticipating that technology was going to influence the way we understood meaning making. But now it's become ubiquitous in our working lives. Very few sites uh, operate now without uh, the new digital technology shaping what happens, whether it's medicine or you know, engineering or, you know, making cars. The one site where it hasn't taken on as much as it has in other sites, in fact, is education. However, the digital is ubiquitous in making meaning now uh, for folks across those domains. It's certainly ubiquitous in personal life and certainly uh, public life and citizenship is influenced by what happens in these digital spaces and we need to be uh, aware of, of that and to harness the potential. So we've been talking about the life world and one of the things we've wanted to try, wanted to do is say, uh, what are the dimensions of difference? So we have a bunch of kids that come into our class or a bunch of students that come into a lecture theatre um, and that if we're to connect with their life worlds, if we're to connect the world of formal education with their experience, their, their, the things that they know, their life aspirations, their, their, their hopes, we actually have to know quite a lot about them. And what we've been trying to do is think systematically, what are the kind of differences which are germane to education? How do we connect with those, those life worlds? And this is the kind of theory we've been working on for a while about these three forms of differences, material differences, which are really about resources and access to, to, um, uh, to, to social resources, but also most importantly, learning resources. You know, what's the quality of schooling? What, but what are the surrounding resources? Access to libraries and devices and, you know, these are material things actually, which are, are, are fundamentally uh, questions of equity about access to knowledge and learning. Embodied differences, you know, age. Obviously, schools are very age uh, graded, but you know, race, sex, sexuality, physical and mental abilities, that that whole world. And then symbolic differences, um, which are you know, cultural differences and differences of identity. Um, and we put in episteme there, which is you know, ways of thinking. We use that word to think about ways of thinking. Now, you know, one of the things about identity politics, which has been a dominant uh, thing in a dominant phenomenon in dealing with differences is that um, firstly, it seems to be about groups that have been systematically marginalized on the, along the way around some of these categories, not, but not all of them. But one of our most important comments is that every one of these categories applies to everybody. And that in everybody's case, it's a unique configuration of these things which builds who they are, which then teachers need to deal with in schools. Curricula need to take this into account, uh, all of these things. So, um, and one of the problems is often we have this kind of superficial appreciation of diversity, which is, oh, we're gonna be nice to people from other cultures and, and we're gonna be, uh, you know, uh, go out of our way to be non-sexist and a whole lot of other things, which is often a bit tokenistic and a bit superficial. Um, but our argument is this is actually incredibly profound, but also this notion which is prevalent these days of intersectionality let's say you you know you're one of these uh, at-risk categories and another at-risk category and it's where those things inter inter intersect that there's extra risk our argument is that this is not a venn diagram we are all all of this all the time and this is a way to analyze uh, the kind of the, the what what's in the life world which is then relevant to learning well, and in, in a traditional classroom, uh, the life world is usually left at the door, like we left our reputations at the door 25 years ago. Uh, and abstraction and formality and rules take over. And the living and the learning is not integrated. And unfortunately, um, some children uh, are able to cope with that context in, in, with more emotional strength than other children or even adults. And we are 
in our uh, paradigm uh, believe that all educators need to un understand whoever is uh, within their con uh, eco educational e ecosystem what the life is for them in that context as well as what they are wanting them to learn. And we'll come back to this diagram at the end because the, the topic or the title we've given this talk is Towards Education Justice. But um, just to give you a couple of examples of the kind of diversity of sites where we've been working, and I can only do this very, very briefly. Um, we were working in a project in northern Greece with some colleagues about Roma communities. This is Europe, but people are living in shanty towns, and in this shanty town, they even built that's the word skoleo, which means school in Greek. Um, so what we've got happening here is a combination of race and poverty and locale. Um, this was a particular community which had set up its community in a rubbish tip because they were uh, dealing in uh, recycled metal. Um, um, and so in other words, every one of those dimensions you've got to take into a place in that context. Another context where we worked was in Australia, in remote Indigenous communities. And this is a place which is uh, called Utopia, no less. Um, uh, it's out in the desert. You can see the, the red sand of the Australian desert there. But look at that school just covered in, covered in paintings, all of which mean stuff. So the community is pretty poor on a lot of, uh, a lot of standards, but nevertheless, um, there's this rich multimodality. And on the right is a piece of student work where they're bringing together literacy in English with literacy in Indigenous languages with uh, those images. And by the way, all of those patterns actually mean something in terms of that community. So these are two examples, just very, very briefly, of um, bringing those tools uh, of understanding the life world context of learning to bear on an analysis of an educational uh, challenge or, 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 or issue. So if we go to the, that second question, you know, if literacy is to be reformed, then what is literacy? and how do we engage with it. Uh, in the original multiliteracies uh, uh, outline, we had five modes. We talked about five modes. We've since moved to seven, what we call uh, forms of meaning uh, in order to kind of uh, be more detailed. And we'll, we'll say some more about that later, but also one of the uh, issues that came up right back then, 25 years ago, was that all meaning was in flux, all meaning was in, uh, was moving all the time. Uh, we needed, if we were going to deal with multimodality or multi-forms, we needed a meta-language to understand them uh, and to be able to uh, relate uh, uh, them to each other and to understand the way in which they um, had an impact on the world. Uh, so we will speak about this uh, a little more later, but we came up with the, uh, the idea of transpositions and a, and a transpositional grammar. In fact, I think Gunther was heading in that direction as well before his untimely departure. Um, but certainly we need to, the traditional grammars that we have for traditional alphabetical or symbolic literacy does not help us uh, able to parse or understand multimodality or uh, multiform as we put it. So we'll explain a little bit about this form idea in, in a second. Um, but one of the things I just want to highlight about this uh, particular image, which uh, we'll explain in some more detail in a moment is we the biggest change we made was we don't use the word language or linguistic so we've broken apart text and speech and quite deliberately in this diagram although they're together it's the biggest color contrast and we're going to explain the reasons why um, in in the next few slides but look just to give you an example of multimodality at work just to become very concrete about it this is some marvelous research done by Denise Newfield and tragically Pippa Stein is no longer with us either. Um, they're working with children in Soweto, which is the uh, was originally a, um, a squatter settlement and a very you know, in, on the edge of Johannesburg. And the children in the class were producing these dolls. You see, you know, these are very poor children. They're building them out of uh, bubble wrap and all sorts of things. But they were these beautiful, beautiful dolls that came with stories uh, and that came with 
the children's bodies because they were kind of mimicking their own bodies, these things could be acted out, and the stories then could be written. So there was a set of transitions between the object, the doll, the, the, the child's own body, the narrative which could then perhaps be written or, or told. So it's movement backwards and forwards between. Now, of course, every, every kindergarten teacher knows this is what you need to do anyhow. But unfortunately, what we've done with literacy is we've kind of often separated these things as a separate formal kind of subject. That's just a little example from the research, the, the New London Research Group. Uh, in fact, in fact, what we do is uh, little kids come into the kindergarten classroom touching, dancing, drawing, and we strip all that down as they move through the system uh, so that they end up at the end of the, you know, the top end of their education only with alphabetical literacy as the main way in which they make meaning and are judged to make meaning. Now, if we take multimodality seriously, uh, then we need to have a, a framework for valuing each mode uh, in, in a, with the same kind of weight. And what we came up with, uh, you know, after we left that the fir that first multiliteracy thinking round, uh, we came up with five questions that you could ask across any mode, right? And we call these the functions of meaning. Uh, the f one of them is reference, you know, what is this about, whether it's a, a text or an image or a sound. Uh, uh, agency, who or what is involved in, in that text or image or sound. What's the structure of that particular artifact or the text or the embodied kind of action? How does it hang together? What is the context in which that text or image or uh, embodied action uh, 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 appears and finally and equally importantly is interest you know what is the why is that text written the way it is written or that image presented the way that it is or the or the sound uh, constructed as it is so these five uh, questions which we call the functions of meaning uh, we believe can be applied effectively uh, to any mode or any form in order to pass the meaning and in, and in fact to uh, you know uh, multiple modes and multiple forms also just to give a little bit of a background i mean um the questions there are meant to be relatively straightforward questions which can be asked um of any um uh, in, in, you know, in, in a classroom in a relatively straightforward kind of way. Um, but just on the left there is a little bit of an analysis of where these ideas come from theoretically. So this is for people who are a little bit more academically and, and theoretically inclined. Um, so the first three are from versions of what Michael Halliday says. They're not quite the same, but they're, they're in the spirit of Michael Halliday, systemic functional grammar. So referring is ideational, dialogue is interpersonal, text um, structure is, is more or less textual. But out, you know, that's what's used for in, in the linguistic system. Usually outside of the system is context. Um, pragmatics as a kind of a, a sub-discipline of linguistics. Um, could we get a new power supply into here? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I'm just I'm running my computer on battery, so now I'm back on power. Um, yes, so um, uh, pragmatics deals with context. Um, and then um, uh, interest is really where people like Freire or Habermas, um, they have notions of interest, which is, like, okay, what's the purpose? What's the social, the social context is there, but then why is something happening? What's the difference between an advertisement and a, a scientific description, for example? It's a, it's a very important part of the exercise, if you like, of parsing the text. Um, now, the, the, what's new about this? is we've been trying to build a grammar that will work for all forms of meaning. And this gets us to this word form. Form and function is a very, um, it's a kind of an elegant, clear contrast. The word form is used by Bakhtin and many people in the field. What we felt was that mode became pretty rubbery and a bit hard to tell what, what, a, you know, what a mode was and where it ended. And we thought we would try and system build a systematic theory of these forms in contrast to functions of meaning. And why were we going to do that? Well, because we wanted to build a grammar, but not in the conventional sense of syntax. Do you want to pick up on the noun? 
Um, from the conversations we were having about um, the life world and uh, multiliteracies did require to think again uh, systematically about how you would analyse uh, any kind of event or any artefact or, or, or any creation of meaning. And we didn't believe that the tools that existed were sufficient to do that in in the world of multimodality or, or the world of multiform meaning making. And uh, the call right at the beginning was for a meta language that the, those of us who are educators or, or linguists needed to address this as, as a serious issue. And in fact, uh, there were different people in different places, particularly around the visual, who try to come up with some systematic way of analysing the visual. And in fact, in some disciplines, music and, 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 and art, for example, there were, again, systemic ways of being able to analyse those forms. But we didn't have uh, one that would allow us uh, to help uh, students in uh, educational context be able to parse the world of multiform meaning making and particularly particularly uh, given the way in which meaning is uh, impacted upon by the affordances of the digital. So if you like this becomes a, a framework for analysing um, anything and everything in the world, you know, <laughs> texts, images, spaces, objects, bodies, sounds, speech and combinations of those. I mean this is kind of the, the unfortunate thing is this is a bit deceptive because these things often mostly don't happen by themselves. They often happen in relation to each other, hence the point about multimodality. So it, what we've got is these kind of two axes, a meaning functions axis and a meaning forms axis. And the simplest version of what we're saying is, okay, let's use this, um, let, let, let's use this matrix, let, let's use this framework to analyse meaning. A little example. Example next, which I'm going to hand over to Mary for. <laughs> Um, so here's one example of a work of art. And by the way, at this point, we're going back to Utopia. This is from an old lady in that community at Utopia where you saw the pictures of those schools, an old lady out in the desert. Right. So, you know, the form is an image, you know, so how, how can we use the five questions to kind of understand what's happening at the higher order, not at kind of other levels of uh, depth? But in terms of reference, what does this refer to? You know, obviously the the yam, the land. The yam, herself. by the way, is a is a creeper that grows across the ground. Right. Just to, yeah. and and this represents Emily herself. This is her yam, her people, and uh, it's it's uh, uh, pictured here in this particular design. And what what's the agency question? Who 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 is actually acting here? Well, in fact, the land itself is speaking. You know, the country which belongs to Emily and she belongs to the to the country and and the yams and the people live in relationship to each other. In terms of the structure, it's organized with the shoots and the roots and the creepers and the cracks in the desert and the painted lines. Um, and in the context, it's in the context of her people, but it's also in the context of a gallery because this work was done um, uh, to be um, sold in, in the modern world, right? It's not for traditional purposes. Um, it is made in order uh, to uh, circulate in the world. But importantly, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the interest, uh, there is a, a politics uh, to this or, you know, a, an idea from uh, that Emily has about how she can share what she can share that's public with the world and also her need to make money for her community. So the five questions can be asked at the top level in order to interpret uh, the multiple meanings in this particular artefact. So um, what transposition about now, which is this other key word that we're working on, is movements across forms and functions of meaning. So this is the other idea that we're, we're, we're moving uh, towards. So look, uh, we can have a sentence, the mountains loom large, and on the right there's a picture. And in fact, you can see that the, the roof line is, actually happens to be the house in Greece where Mary was born, in a very mountainous part of Greece. So these two things are actually saying the same thing. 
but they're saying them in quite profoundly different ways. And sometimes we want to have the word and the image because the two complement each other. So um, this is just a, a, simply an example of transposition, which is, you know, we're moving between a sentence about those mountains and a picture about those mountains. So that, that's a very simple version of what we mean by this. But I'm going to get difficult and technical for a few slides. So those of you who um, just be patient with me <laughs> um, along the way, what we want to try and do is build um, a language to speak about text and image in the same way. So what we've done in the transpositional grammar is we've suggested the word might be entity in action. This is what we're doing when we do. These are two examples of reference. You know, there are entities out there in the world. And by the way, we normally do them with nouns in text and actions and we normally do with verbs. But in pictured things, um, um, uh, you know, you know um, in, in images, um, you know, noun-like things are pictured things and actions are vectors. So we're trying to build this, you know, in the first column, a shared language to explain the two the similar things that are going on in both cases. And here's a, um, an example um, of one particular transposition. And it's, it's a classic thing from science. Here's Newton, and this is a little quote from his um, optics. Um, and you can see here that instead of changing something, instead of refracting happening as a verb, instead of modifying happening as a verb, instead of refraction as an action, instead of terminating as a, you know, these are all things, or mixing or emerging or, you know, these are things which could have been, um, could have been um, um, uh, um, verbs which are turned into nouns. And by the way, on the right hand side, we're doing the same thing. What we're doing is we're, we've got entities. You can see they're the lens, but you can also see vectors, lines which are showing directions in which light is shining. So in other words, what we're doing is we're doing the same kind of move in both places. Now, um, um, so, so this is, by the way, an example um, of this, you know, entity in action process um, and, and the way in which that's, that's ha that, that happens. Now, let me just go to here, um, a, a little trick. Um, if, if you want your kids to do well at science, you tell them to turn every action into an entity. <laughs> you know, turn those verbs into nouns and you'll sound like you're a serious kind of scientist. So this is just an example of the way in which that movement between nouns and verbs. Nouns and verbs are not fixed things. They're in relation to each other and you can move backwards and forwards between them in the way in which you express uh, your meaning. Another example. Um, um, we have suggested this notion of instance and concept. So what we have here is, you know, Mary Calancis, that's a proper noun, you know, uh, um, that's her name. Um, person is a common noun. Um, but what we, we can do the same thing in image with a realistic picture, that's unequivocally Mary in the picture, um, or an icon or abstract picture of a person. Now, the, the important point about transposition is these things are not stable. You know, Mary is also a person, right? And persons are all, always instantiated. So we're always moving backwards and forwards. It's this idea of movement. So we saw movements between entity and action, backwards and forwards. We make that movement to do science. Um, now we've got this movement between instance and concept. So these things, um, really, there are two things we're doing here. One is creating this general language that apply to both, but then talking about the relationship. These are not fixed things. We've put them in these neat little boxes here. But in fact, um, Mary is always ready to be a person, and a person is always ready to be named as Mary, right? It's about the movement backwards and forwards between those things, whether it be um, in text or in image. Another function to function transposition. I'm just giving you some examples about movement. So, you know, we think straightforward in literacy that it's about communication. It's about, you know, having a message, getting it out, and somebody getting what you're saying. Hey, that's not true. Um, within agency, we have this notion of participation and meaning, which is very, very active. So the first thing is when you think about things, you can think about them in words. Um, and by the way, when you do think about them in words, um, they are usually... Um, predicates with no subjects because the predicate's obvious to you. You only need a predicate when you speak, right? So grammatically, and this is one of the profound points that Vygotsky makes, thinking in speech is so different from actually speaking out loud because you don't need to be explicit about its reference point because you know it. So you only think in predicates more or less. Um, but same with images, by the way. When you think, when you imagine a picture of something in your mind's eye, it's incredibly different from seeing something or incredibly different from picturing something, um, so, which is communication. 
and then, of course, when interpretation happens, um, it's only on the basis of one's own experience. You know that life world idea again? Uh, you, you only hear what you're able to hear based on your life experience. So the whole transposition point is that communication is not a straightforward process of passing on messages. It's a process of change. It's a, pro a process of movement between each of those things. And one more example, this is just examples of some of the transpositions that we want to try to, to illustrate in this grammar. This is in the structure part of the grammar where we're talking about design, design work, um, uh, uh, or found designs. Let's start at the bottom left hand corner as well. We have all these patterns of meaning in the world um, that what we do is we then make our own meaning. So, you know, the sentences, the last 50 words you've just uttered in your life have never been uttered by anybody in quite that way ever before. So what you're doing is you're taking resources, you're reworking them, and the product is designed artifacts, the world is remade. So this is a process of change. So what transposition about is looking at changes that are made uh, via the action of meaning makers. So that's just to illustrate the transposition idea. Um, now we want to move on particularly, and I'm just looking at the time here, we'd better um, sort of go, faster. go a bit faster. So again, look, this is a bit technical, folks, but I'm going to just say it there so you can get a flavour of what we're thinking. So one of our forms is text, okay? And we've developed this definition of text is graphemes, of which there are two types of graphemes, phonemes, which is sound contrasts represented in text, and idea contrasts, ideographs. And of course, Chinese is, is made up primarily of ideographs. We're now in a world full of emojis. And of course, all numbers are ideographs as well. So, um, and one of the, the interesting things about the digital world is that it's been systematically documented in a single universal character set, which is called Unicode. So our definition of text is um, uh, the, uh, the, the application of the graphemes of, uh, of Unicode. Now, this now, is the point I mentioned before, which is a difficult point, which I'm going to make again in a synoptic kind of way, hoping you just get a feel for the idea. What we want to argue is that text and speech are just about the two most contrasting of all those forms, right? They are incredibly different to each other. So firstly, text is purely a matter of sight, right? And speech is purely a matter of hearing. Right, so in fact, of all the forms, um, these are the only ones which can be isolated into one of the senses. And in fact, image is is is, is um, text is much more like image, um, and and speech is very much like sound. So what we do with text is we design our meanings by placing things. So we move those those uh, graphemes around um, on a two-dimensional plane. Whereas what we do with speech is it's in, t in time. So if I make a mistake, I, you know, I have to repeat things. Um, uh, it's, it's difficult to recover. And in fact, what it means is that going back to text now, um, text struggles to express time. Um, so um, 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 whereas um, speech struggles to, to express space. Um, and also the, just the basic organizational principles that we have in text, sentences, paragraphs, and principles of non-redundancy, you know, you make sure the word doesn't get repeated, um, and, and essentially a hierarchical architecture in writing. Um, whereas what we have is a serial architecture in speech, which is clauses, breadth groups, and so on. And the design process, the last point, is multilinear in text. So particularly now with word processing, I go backwards and forwards, and I remove a word and I delete something and whatever. It's a you know your eye goes backwards and forwards across the screen, but also the multilinear process is around the hierarchy that's in text, and whereas a linear arrangement in time with speech, you know what we what we've often thought is that okay literacy is easy because it's a transliteration of speech in fact they're profoundly different and mary and i have reached the point now where we think the words language and linguistic are um are really problematic because they lump together things that are too that are, that are so profoundly different so this is our diagram of the different forms of meaning now where we've elaborated a little bit more we said look text is pretty well like image you're arranging stuff on a two-dimensional plane. Maybe we might arrange it on a three-dimensional plane where we, we put it in space, we put a sign up, for example, in space. But on the right, what we're doing is we're, in, we're arranging in time sounds when we do speech, and often they're supplemented by body. So we put these things together uh, in a deliberate kind of way, and the reason why we have that contrast is that 
learning to produce written text is a deceptively big jump away from speech. Um, now, what we've also been thinking about is, okay, what are the contemporary narrative, um, the contemporary uh, genres, the main genres these days um, in in this particular um, universe? So, you know, this is our new classification of these. I won't go into a huge amount of detail of it, but also one of the things in terms of our definition of um, the manipulation of graphemes on a two-dimensional plane, algorithmic text, which is mathematical text and software is exactly that. That's all it is. These are actually forms of writing um, along the way. But all of these, um, not only are these all forms of writing, if we operate purely about moving graphemes around on a two-dimensional array, that's the first column. But in the second column, so much of those uh, genres, narrative, lyric, information, argument, algorithm, we're now um, uh, enriching with these multi-form meanings. Right. So this is just more or less to bring this to a kind of I'll, I'll, two slides. I'll bring this to an end, and then Mary will do the the final section, which is a shorter section. I, I, um, I um, apologise for overwhelming you. <laughs> yeah. No. Look. I mean, uh, that was the hard stuff. So, <laughs> but just to give you a sense of some of the thinking yeah. we've, we've been having lately. So here we go. We come back to this diagram. We have these multi-form transpositions where we move backwards and forwards between combinations of these forms of meaning. And the multifunction transpositions are different ways in which we can think about um, the meanings that we're operating. And this slide is completely overwhelming, uh, where we've just got a map. This is a, a more detailed map of the whole thing. Let's just stay there for a minute. Don't, don't go off. Bill. Just go back to that one. Yeah. Um, these are you can't you can't see it very well, but they they're the five questions, the five uh, functions broken down. Uh, into their component parts uh, that you can use in order to uh, interpret uh, the world. Um, we, I want to apologise to you for, for us having so much uh, that we want to say to you today because uh, we can't talk about multimodality and multiform without a, a meta language. And we're trying to contribute to that with uh, this particular uh, f framework and ideas that we're sharing with you today. But very quickly now, the, the third question uh, about uh, pedagogy. Um, uh, I just, uh, this particular image here uh, represents the range of choices that are available uh, in making decisions uh, for individual purposes uh, and for disciplinary uh, purposes. Um, uh, could you just go to the next one, Bill? Keep going to the one uh, f further along. No, next no, one's no, an example. No, no, I'll, no, I'll keep go going back. One more. One, one more. One more. Right. I'll just there. The, these uh, we talk about experiencing and immersion uh, in the new and in the known, and that has a, a connection with progressivist pedagogy or what's called authentic pedagogy. Uh, we have conceptualising by classifying or by theory, and that tends to go with kind of front-end loading didactic uh, pedagogy of transmission. Uh, Analysing uh, either functionally or critically, which uh, comes from uh, critical pedagogy, and of course applying creatively or appropriately. Now, this is not a, a framework that has a linear uh, trajectory. Uh, every educator who, that is deciding on uh, a particular epistemic goal uh, needs to make choices uh, from the range that is available to them in order to achieve that particular goal. And uh, part of the criticism of pedagogy in the past was that it was too didactic uh, and it relied on memory and just classifying and theories. Uh, with progressivism is that they never moved away from experiencing the new and the known uh, and didn't move into um, uh, conceptualising. And of course, uh, uh, critical uh, pedagogy itself uh, has been criticised if it doesn't also lead to application of knowledge in particular environments. So we, we offered this as a, a model uh, for advancing uh, the, the reform of literacy pedagogy uh, um, in order that uh, educators uh, were able to 
uh, make choices uh, from a broader range of, of possibilities that was meaningful and purposeful. So this was the little example which I'll give very, very quickly. Um, uh, this is a, a school in far northern Australia. This is Torres Strait Creole on the left, so it's connecting with the life world of, uh, of, of students. Experiencing the known is that outside the window there are coconut palms. Um, experiencing the new, we're doing science. Um, and we might talk about seeds in other parts of the world, but here we've got a classic multimodal text. By the way, it says today is Thursday, 10th of October, the route, he goes down, and the teachers even corrected the spelling there in Torres Strait Keol, uh, the, the, the shoot, he goes up. And then we've got these classic pieces of scientific labelling along the way. And what we're doing here is we're conceptualising, we're building a little theory about roots and seeds, um, and perhaps we might go on and um, you know, so, so this is a, a kind of a literacy exercise where one can take all these knowledge processes and parse the range of strategies that the teacher is using. Then just to finish this section now, um, because I'm conscious that we're right near the end, okay. um, what we've been doing lately and been trying to think about, okay, um, Bloom's taxonomy is really focused on the cognitive. Originally Bloom had, um, uh, the plan was to do a, um, uh, objectives which are also um, uh, psychomotor and affective. Uh, now that's more conventionally called socio-emotional and embodied. So what we're thinking is that the top two, those knowledge processes in the top um, two quadrants um, are more socio-emotional and embodied and the, and the other ones are more cognitive. We want to build a kind of a balanced repertoire of activities. So then conclusion now, we're right near, right at the end. Um, so and hopefully we'll have a two, few minutes for questions. So look, we're hoping that this kind of analysis of what kinds of um, learning resources required, one size kinds of um, you know epistemic conditions um, can can serve two purposes. One is one of redistribution, which is a pedagogy of access, giving people uh, the skills they need to get good jobs. That's one aspect of access. Um, it might be to create a more just world where more people get access. But recognition also is recognition of those cultural differences, which is what we call the pedagogy of inclusion. So we're hoping that the effects of this work uh, will be able to uh, achieve these justice goals. Um, last word from Gunter Chris. Yes, um, this is a sad image from his passing uh, celebration of his life. But he did say, um, he did think that what we did together way back then in, in, in uh, 25 years ago was meaningful for all of us, that many people would take up those ideas, but he said that nothing was going to be the same again once we began on that path of seeing literacy in multiple forms, modality in its uh, multiple forms, and uh, that we needed to rethink uh, everything from the grammar that we used to address it, the practices in the classroom, and the way that we engaged with learners in every environment. Some contact points for us. So thank you very much, folks, and um, uh, I'm sure there's, a, there's a, apologies, as Mary says, for there, there being a lot to absorb, but we thought it was probably best, you know, in the time that we've got, that we give you a kind of an overview of, um, of, of, of the, well, this multiliteracy idea and where it's come from and where we are now with it. Thank you very much, you and Mary, for the brilliant and inspiring presentation. Can we all put our hands together to thank them? Thank you so much. And I must add that it was wonderfully orchestrated between the two of you. 